Quite often I'm asked how I got my Willie's Night convertible cabriolet model 66A. Well, about six years ago, a friend of mine called me up, and I had worked with her for quite some time, and asked me if I would want the car that they've had in storage for 53 years. It seems that their storage bill was uh, getting a little more than they wanted to pay for, and they needed to do something with the car. So she called me up, I met with her, she gave me the key to the storage, and she said, please do something with this car, buy it, sell it, donate it, I don't care what's done with it, I just need to stop paying on the storage. So I took the key, and I went over to the storage unit where she showed me where it was, and I opened the door, and it was instant love. I didn't know what this car was, so I've been a mechanic for over 41 years, at, and I had never worked on a Willys Night, especially a model. 66 say 1927. When I opened the hood of this engine, on the engine of this car, it was one I had never seen before. Uh, it looks like a boat anchor, to be truthful with you, but I fell in love with the car. It had so much dust on this car, it was incredible. The convertible top was uh, in a disarray, and so was the interior. It was pretty ratty. Uh, a lot of the original leather was still in the car, and it only had 24,000 miles on it. So. I took the key, closed the door, thought about the car, went home, talked to my husband about it, and, and we both agreed it was probably something he didn't want, uh, but it was something I've always wanted. I always wanted a gangster kind of looking car, and this kind of had the running boards, the wooden spoke wheels, so it was kind of a cool little car. So I had to do some research on the car. I found out that it was a uh, handmade car uh, back in 1927, and it was worth at that time, $2,295 to purchase the car, which was a lot of money in those days. So we were sitting around a couple of weeks later with some friends, and I said, hey guys, I've got this key to storage. How about if we go get a car? So we all loaded up, got the car trailer hooked up, and off we went. I opened the storage door, and they just could not believe this car. It was all original paint. There were some dents in it, you will see that. You'll have, we have pictures of what the interior looked like and the process we went through to actually bring her back to her own. She's running on all her own parts from 1927 uh, with, a, with the help with some friends on some issues that we had and we'll, we'll talk about those. So we began to try to get this car to load on the trailer. Well, sitting for so many years, the transmission was stuck in gear. So I had to actually sit in the car and hold the clutch in while we tried to force the tire to uh, go backwards. But there was also two flat tires. And the tires were original, so they were hard as a rock. Trying to get those to roll, once we got it up off the flat spots, it was easy to roll until it got to the flat spot again. So we had to keep using a jack to lift it up and get it to the roll. Then finally, once we got it on the car trailer ramps, we just had to drag it, which ripped the tires up. It didn't hurt the wheels, thank goodness which were in pristine shape. Finally got it on the trailer, strapped her down, and as we headed up the highway going towards our house, the layers of dust of 53 years were rolling off this car. It looked like a dust storm if you were driving behind us. So once we got the car home, we had to push it into the shop, of course, getting it off the trailer. And then I began the process of reviving her. When I started to understand how this engine had, has functioned, it's a sleeve valve engine, which is kind of like a two-stroke, but only really a four. And it has a piston with two outer sleeves. And the sleeves take the place of valves and lifters. And we'll show you how that works here shortly. So I thought I had it all together, put water in it. It was coming out faster than I could put it in. Seems that there was a crack in the block, and we'll show you that too. Then I fixed that with the help of my friends over at Ames uh, Machine Shop in Sparks, Nevada. They were able to give me some uh, engine epoxy, and I was able to get on both sides of the crack and was able to seal it. It worked really well. That took a couple of months to get all that. Once that was fixed, I thought, well, we're ready to go, we're ready to try to get her to start. But that didn't happen. I put the water in, it was coming out again. Come to find out, the bottom of the radiator had uh, a crack in it. They did drain most of the water out, but they left some in some areas that they didn't realize. So I took the radiator out, took it down to Ames, uh, I'm sorry, took it down to A1 radiator in, Spark in Reno, and my friend Tony over there was so kind, he actually repaired the radiator at no cost. And this is a honeycomb type radiator, if you're not familiar with that. 
Um, you can see that it looks like a honey cone, like the cone of a, a beehive, and those are quite expensive. But he knew that I was trying to get this car ready to roll so my friends could have one last ride in it uh, since they were up in years, and he did it without any cost, which I am very grateful to him because it could have been as much as $1,100 to get this radiator repaired. So once that was done, I reinstalled it into the vehicle, put water in it. She was holding. I was excited. Then I tried to start it. We found out that back then they had white metal, and this was the first year of anti-theft ignition and roll-up windows. So today that would not be a surprise to us, but back then this was also the first year of an enclosed car, which could be rather treacherous in bad weather. So I was able to figure out that uh, they had not used the ignition switch for the anti-theft because the anti-theft was you just turn the key and it would actually put power to the distributor to allow the car to start. Well, somebody, because the white metal way back when went bad, they actually put a pull switch on it to, uh, to compensate for that. So once, was that, once the, that was all repaired, we finally were ready to get her to see if we could get her to start. We actually got the transmission drained. I put diesel in it for about two weeks. It freed it up. I cleaned it out. Oh my God, she was like in pristine condition. Drained the rear end oil, replaced that, pulled the wheels off because of course the tires were hard as rocks and they needed to be replaced. So we actually um, put it on jack stands and I began the process of trying to start it. I found out that I had to put a quarter cup of oil in each cylinder before I could even actually get the car to start which was new to me as being a mechanic of today's technology. So the reason that is, is because the oil takes up the space where the louvers, I mean, I'm sorry, the, where the sleeves uh, go up and down in the tolerance. So that actually gives the compression because it sat so long there was no oil at the top end of the engine. So we had to actually pull each spark plug out, put a quarter cup of oil in each cylinder, and she was ready to roll. Took us a little bit, but we did finally get her to start. And here's the video on our very first time that we got her to start. Okay, go. It's in reverse, too. No, that's the way it goes. It's going forward. <laughs> Look at the license plate. The fan pulls it in. Oh, yeah, the fan pulls it in. Look at the choke on the car. That was the license plate. We're going to have to do something to build right against the radiator. Oh, yeah. Now they are. Going on down the road. I closed your window on your truck, too, after the last night. You left the driver's door window open. Oh. <laughs> thing is so quiet. Yeah, isn't it quiet? You put the hood on here, you won't even hear it. You can hear it, and it's stuck in the air. Yeah. Getting a tick now. Got a bent post on. <clears throat> okay, so once we got this to start, as you can see, smoke is its only downfall. And it's not that it's burning the oil, 
it uses oil to keep the sleeves that's around the pistons lubricated. So what it doesn't use to lubricate, it actually sends out the tailpipe. So I tell people it's my bug abatement car because she smokes pretty good and she was born a smoker. So there's nothing that you actually can do for this car. That's part of her design. So we got her to run and then the next step was to actually get her mechanically sound. So rebuilt the carburetor, got her to run, then rebuilt the carburetor, uh, actually pulled the wheels off, replaced the brake linings, put new brakes. Uh, there's no mechanical, or I'm sorry, there's no hydraulics on this car. Everything is mechanical. And we're going to show you how the brakes have to be adjusted uh, in order to keep them uh, at proper specs so that you can stop. Uh, the only thing that this car has that's hydraulic is four-wheel hydraulic suspension. So going down the road, it's like riding on air. It's, it's pretty cool. Uh, I uh, hooked up with a friend of mine, Tim, who actually helped me. We redid the top, and you'll be amazed at how many nails that they used, and they were all handmade nails, and I'll show you those here. As you can see, these are handmade nails, the square heads, and they, have, they used all of those for the convertible top and to install, and to, uh, install the interior. So we removed all of that, cleaned everything up. I, there's a wooden compartment in the back behind the seat that's uh, just kind of like a little um, storage compartment. So I had to rebuild all that. There was one bow on the crossbar for the convertible top that I actually had to recarve, which turned out pretty nice. And then we went through the process of putting the top on, redoing the interior, and the rumble seat actually has still some of the original leather in it, and, but we redid the carpet, and kept the paint, just wiped her down with some kerosene. The bumpers were, uh, that are on the car were actually an accessory. You had to buy those extra when you purchased the car. They came without bumpers. So we checked out the electrical, Got new tires, new brakes, engine was sound, and we started to drive her. And we'll show you that here now. Okay, now let's see what the interior looks like today. As you can see, we've done quite a bit of work getting this back to drivable condition. And uh, we're going to open the rumble seat here in just a second for you. Okay, here in the rumble seat, this actually is still the original leather from 27. We were able to get this uh, a little uh, lubricated up to soften it a little bit. We did replace the bottom cushion. And then, of course, the carpet is a little messed up. We had some people in here the other day taking a ride. But there's also a golf door. This car was made for people who were golfers. So on the other side, there's a golf door, and we'll show you that. So right here is the, is a golf door, and you would put your golf clubs in here. You could also use it for uh, storage when you go to the grocery store, I guess, uh, because you can't put it in the rumble seat once you close it. You can in the foot area, you probably could, but that's considered the golf door. And then you notice these are wooden spoke wheels on this car. They say the car can go 75 miles an hour, but I doubt it with me in it, not with wooden spoke wheels. So we're going to take her over to the shop, we're going to put it up on the lift, and we're going to show
you can see right here, this is the original exhaust. This car's only got 24,000 miles on it. This is the original exhaust from 27. Now as you look here, you can see that there's two levers on this side. Then we're going to move to this other side. Watch your head. And there's two levers on this side. Okay. okay, these levers here, the ones on each side, these are actually what you adjust to adjust the brakes. Because they're all mechanical brakes. There's no hydraulics to these at all. They're all mechanical levers. And then you can see from up here that most of this car is wood. This is the flooring. All your inner shell is made out of wood. Back then they didn't have the technology that we have today to actually be able to press the metal to form the, the car's outer shells. And then as I said, there's only four-wheel hydraulic suspension. That's the only thing hydraulic on this car. So these are actually your hydraulics right here. So this, this is filled with fluid, and as, it, as you go down the road, and this, this arm will actuate up and down, which will keep the, the car with a nice cushion ride. These are your vehicles. It, when you wanted to grease the chassis, you actually have grease fittings just like the cars today, but more so because everything is mechanical. And it takes a special grease gun, if you want to call it. And if you look in here, you can see these grease fittings actually interlock, and I'll show you how that works. You'll just slide it up to these, then you'll give it a twist, and it stays. And to put the grease in, you just twist the handle, and you can see the grease coming out. Then you just untwist, you're good to go. Back during the early 20s and 30s, and even the 1900s, what you had here is if the car could not, you couldn't get the car to start, you would actually crank start it. And to crank start it, in this car, you would have to take this cap off, slide your crank in here, and then crank start it. And that's your manual start. It didn't have any electrical power for some reason. Okay, I'm going to show you what a, the sleeve valve engine looks like under the hood of this car. Pretty simplistic, really. You got your generator, which turns actually operates the distributor off a of gear. You got your ignition coil. Here's your starter. Then you have your copper lines that actually circulate the oil. And here's where it gets injected into the, into the sleeves to keep it lubricated. And then you have your exhaust manifold, which has a crossover, which actually goes over to where the carburetor is. And we'll show you that here shortly. Let's go over to the other side. Okay, your horn, of course. This is your intake manifold. Here's your um, carburetors down here. It's what they call an updraft. They didn't have the technology yet where the carburetor sits on top of the engine. Now today in today's cars is all fuel injected. But you can see it actually heats, heats the vapor of the fuel which gives it the rise to go into the intake manifold. Your air filter. It's cleanable. It's not replaceable. And then uh, if, if you want to look over here, this is what's called an auto vac. It's half vacuum, half fuel pump. And that's exactly what uh, back then what they used to keep a fuel supply. So if you ever had to go up a hill, you had a little reservoir of fuel and it created the vacuum in order to suck the fuel um, to bring the, from it from the fuel tank. So let's take it out on the road and see how she drives.